you know when you think of do you do you like does your dad live in the same place that he lived years ago? Yeah, yeah. my dad, uh, born and raised Kalispell, Montana, uh, and that's where I grew up too. Did you know all my school, high school, then moved out in the Midwest to do college. But yeah, and Bob Allen. What was the man, what was the still, town? He's like? still out there. What was the town like that you grew up in? I want to say it was. When I grew up there, it was a pretty small town, 10, 15,000 people, maybe. Mm. Beautiful northwest corner of the Rocky Mountains, really close to Glacier Park, which is a big, like, national park destination for a lot of people in the U.S. Mountainous. lived, grew up in a valley, so big mountains, big, like, you know, uh, cinematic Just mountain looks, ranges. looks amazing, yeah. Wherever you look, you know, yeah, like... Yeah, yeah. Wow, very similar to like Colorado, um, same mountain range. Is there any mountain so, lions? Yeah. And Did it, you have mountain lions? Oh, for sure. Seriously? Oh yeah, mountain lions, grizzly. Yeah, oh. I mean, we're right, like all that stuff, all that classic stuff. But when I grew up there, I didn't, I took it totally for granted. I was like, ugh, mountains, who cares? <laughs> you know, because like, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. A, as you do as a ch as an entitled child, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, learning to see the world. And then when I came to the Midwest, uh, you know, there's no mountains. And sometimes I would see there'd be a storm or something, and I'd see the clouds on the horizon, and I would think, oh, mountains. And then oh, no, not mountains, <laughs> that, <what laughs> not do, at do, all. And do you, I guess, do you wish that like do you appreciate it now when you go back? Oh, of, of course. I mean, it's so, it's so lovely. Yeah. You can take a train too. There's a great train service called Amtrak that, I don't know, it's, it's debatable on how great it is, but the ride through, um, you know, you go through the Midwest and then there's a line that runs up through Glacier Park and yeah. it is, I mean, Scott, I'm talking like train bridges, like, you know, oh, those huge with stilts that go down a hundred feet I'm, into I'm the river, you know. Glacier Park. Oh, yeah. Look, Glacier Park. It's... And how close oh, I love how you say Glacier. 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 <laughs> glacier. Glacier. Uh, glacier. Dude, I'm, glacier? I'm working on... P.S. P.S. Sidebar. I'm working on an accent because I think that we need to do a video where we swap. Oh, I could do that. I could do that. The problem with so you gotta yeah the, you gotta start working on your American. The American uh, things are hard though working. because you've all got these like <laughs> really like mine's your. I'm, I'm not even sure what my accent is. I think it's just a, yeah, a bizarre I, mix. I'm, yeah, I'm working on it, dude. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try to unveil it at some point. Have you got a Montana <laughs> accent? Mm -mm. Well, I don't. <sighs> Definitely people don't think of Montana as being like a place with an accent. Right. There's, okay, check it out. Accents. There's this one, Midwest, where I live now. Yeah. The typical rural accent here is kind of this. Okay, so maybe if we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about SBL. Have you joined up SBL there, bud? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. It's a little, like it kind of leans into the nose a little bit yeah, there, bud. Yeah, And uh, that, and it almost kind of Canadian, but we don't do the boat. There's none of the boat. Thing a boot, happening. A boot. <laughs> it's still kind of yeah right it's still about about there's that kind of thing but it kind of is this and then you kind of dip down south right and then it kind of goes a little bit back and everything gets a little bit lazier yeah yeah so then this is kind of the southern but there's all kinds of variety of the southern thing too i may be doing <laughs> kind of more of a slow thing right now this kind of feels maybe more like maybe a little more like texas uh so <laughs> <laughs> and then and then the other one that i love there's one and no one in california thinks they have it but california california kind of has like a thing where um where everybody's like oh yeah all right yeah like it kind of just lives a little bit more in this like uh laid back space and you kind of put your vowels at the back of your throat a little bit and it's like oh, yeah that's so interesting fucking a right man yeah that is so interesting <laughs> how you can do that so, <laughs> it's amazing so i'm so 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 when i you know when i'm alone i i try to do i try to do you and i'm i'm gonna <laughs> I wanna one do day that you're gonna absolutely where we, nail it. where we flip yeah dude i'm gonna i'm gonna show up with the glove and then people are really gonna be confused man people are really gonna they're not gonna know 
I'm really not gonna know. I just gotta get on the Peloton, man, and start eating a little better. I gotta, I gotta drop a couple of LBs. You know oh, what I'm dude, saying? Oh, dude, I need to. Right don't, now. My wife is on it at the minute. She, <laughs> honestly, she's on it. She's like, not on the Peloton, but she's, she's like hammering the running machine every single morning. Like, and she's oh, been. Oh, does she oh, really? Yeah, she's been doing it six days a week for seven months. Seven months. <laughs> I, I'm just like my That's guilt. Incredible. My guilt is just getting. Yeah, because like. I used to be like I used to be the fit one of the family. I was like the, the what? now yeah. she's just like leaving me in the I'm, I'm smoked. She's like, <laughs> she's left me behind. What? I never saw it coming either. I never saw it coming. She was just not into it at all, and now she's just on it. It's amazing as well. She's feeling great for it as well. So, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that's very similar. My wife rides the Peloton every day. She has not missed a day since we got the bike. So. It's, I feel like it's maybe been like a year or something crazy like that. Seriously. <laughs> or she hasn't missed a day. And it, of course, and then I started out real strong and I'm like, yeah. And then now I'm, I mean, I'm the biggest slug. I'm the well, you, slug. you, you were put off, yeah, weren't you? For anybody listening, Ian's got a Peloton bike, but he's, he, he was put off because you went on the shop one, didn't you? So you, what did you, you had yours, <sighs> yes. didn't you? You had your Peloton. And then you yes. went on the one in the shop to do your hundredth ride. Is that correct? And then the one in the yes. shop was well, not easier. my hundredth ride. As far as <laughs> yes, your tenth ride, my like twenty eighth ride. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's probably to be fair. Yes, but my wife went. You know, we went in to do her hundredth ride. Right, yeah. so you can go into the shop and, and I got on the bike. Yo, know, and and it was and it the numbers being the same. You know, you crank up resistance with a knob, right, and. And it was so easy, and I'm crushing these big output numbers. So they mm. do this number called output, which is the combination of your cadence rotation and the uh, the resistance, right? And then yeah. you get this output number. And mine was big, bigger than I'd ever seen at home. And I got done with the ride, and you know, and they're kind of going like, "Oh wow!" And I got a personal record, Scott, a PR. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and then everyone in the store is going, "Oh, congratulations on the PR!" <laughs> and here's some juice, and here's some, you know. And, and I and I said, but, and it was so the bike was calibrated so much easier than the one we had at home. Yeah. And then of course you go look it up, and yes, this is a thing. And so it it killed all the competition. For me, of like, oh well, now my old man and I, you know, old Bob Allison, who we're going to visit, yeah, you know, uh, he's riding a bike too, and he has these giant numbers, and I cannot help but think that his bike is just you. Easy. <laughs> I, I know. It's like next week when you get on holiday at your dad's place, the first thing that you're going to be doing, yeah, yeah, dad, get out my way. I'm getting on the Peloton. <laughs> get out exactly. My way. That's what I'm going to do. Oh man. So, uh, but you know, okay, you still, you, you're just, you should just be competing against yourself. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, <laughs> we'll do it's it, still a great what? workout. It's awesome. But do it, dude. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get one. I'm gonna get one. What are we talking Are you about really? Today? I uh, d definitely. Like, I'm definitely gonna get one. I'm definitely gonna get one. Okay, sure. good. Yeah. When you get one, I'm getting back on the bike, Divine. Don't do and that. We'll go don't for put, it. Don't put your guilt in my like. <laughs> oh, I didn't get back on because Divine never got one. <laughs> don't shove your guilt on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. We've got yeah, to do that's it, what, that's what it's going to take to get me back on the bike. We're in the early 40s, oh. dude. We've got to do it. What we're going to talk about today? What, what's the topic? We yeah, what we, do you want? Yeah, yeah like, what do you want to talk about today? Should we just talk, have we done anything about gear? Should we talk about no. the bases that we yeah, love and why? Yeah. <gasps> let's do it. Let's yeah. just go full gear nerd because I've been like I've geeking got out all like, yeah. I was going to say all week, but honestly, kind of sort of like just a confessional. I am just obsessed with base, Re with, with base gear dude with bases specifically not so much amps not so much effects i am like an yep. addict when it comes to bases it's like okay. I'll, I'll wake up in the night i'll look on my phone uh, like for, uh, are you, you on reverb uh, all the time reverb like talk base yes. base chat .co .uk, base like, chat in the uk yeah just like i'm just an addict it's yeah. out of control actually and it does fluctuate it fluctuates up and down has done for the last 20 years but I'm always, yes. I'm always using. <laughs> you know, like I'm always using, but it, but it fluctuates. <laughs> I really, actually appreciate how you put that into like addict terminology. Oh, it's, that is, yeah, that's it's out. Of it is so true. I am the same. 
I'm sure we have different gear acquisition goals. Yeah. But there is not a day that I don't check yeah. talk based classifieds. Yeah. And and reverb for specific things. Now I might have a different oh I'm so excited for this. I'd love to hear from you like what you're going after right now. Because obviously you can you you've got a bunch of stuff, you have access to a lot of things, but what are the things right now that are like super hot on your list? What are the things that you feel like you got to have that you haven't played? Like, I, I want to know, like, where your mind's at right now. Man, it's just such a mess in there. It's just, it's like, it's panic. <laughs> it's like... So yeah. so you don't have, like, a goal, like, this year I'm going to find a great Fodera, or this year I'm going to find a great Rickenbacker. You're just... You're just casting out into the sea <laughs> and, and just, oh, yeah. oh here it, comes something. Imag imagine this. This this is what it's like. Yeah. Right? Imagine okay. an eight-week-old puppy, okay, <laughs> <laughs> an eight-week-old puppy, and, and, and he's in a room, and you put it, and there's like loads of dogs, loads of bowls of dog food everywhere, and toys, <laughs> and yes. two toys, and then you just let him go. <laughs> Just imagine, like, if you've seen an eight, he's just going to run around like a maniac, shoving his and face. Check everything out. Just shoving his face in the food. <laughs> there's food flying everywhere. There's chew toys going everywhere. It's a massacre. That is what my brain is like. There's, 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 sometimes there's a thread of, um, <laughs> sometimes there's a, th a thread of kind of just like purpose behind it. But m a yes. lot of the time, it's just manic it's just manic i've got no idea why oh that's amazing it's probably the only it's like the only area of my life that's like this it's quite bizarre but anyway so right yeah, now right yeah right now it's like an it's old jazz basses old jazz bases. oh yeah old jazz old bases. jazz bases yeah because i've not anywhere between kind of like 60 and and probably mid 70s it kind of like just yeah. fluctuates between those and they're they're very different instruments actually which is interesting they are but it's, very different they're very different but that that is what i'm kind of like you know kind of looking so, for at the minute but it but it fluctuates do you do you like buy one check it out then maybe then maybe then if you don't like it do you send it back do you are, are you are you able to try some of these things i mean Dude, do I have thoughts about jazz basses? I mean, can I just say that I've got big thoughts for you about 60s and 70s era jazz basses? Uh, like, what have you tried? What have you liked? What have you tried and not liked? You have anything at the moment that you want to show us, I've Scott got, Devine? Got anything? I haven't really got so I've got like P bass, P bass. I've got like a farm of P basses. <laughs> yes, I've got yes. so, I've got an interesting thing farm. to let you know about the P bass. Actually, we'll, we'll delve into that in just a few minutes. It's so okay. it's an odd one. It's a bit of a bizarre P bass kind oh. of confessional. But with the I jazz basses, nothing really. I've got like PJs, but really nothing with like J bass pickups. And I have yeah. played. The, the problem with ordering stuff online is that you well you're ordering it just because of the way it looks like fundamentally yeah you, you, does it look cool is it attractive to me i'm gonna buy it and i had this really interesting um situation a couple of years ago where i went i went to a bass shop and i was going to a bass shop to record a comparison video it was like we're going to do sort of like a comparison video of like 20 or 30 bases and i was just going to read i've seen that video seen of it, course right? yes. so i looked on of their course. website before i went and did that video and they had like four or five jazz bases in one of them looked incredible it was just yes so tasty and the other ones yeah they're okay um, sure so i went down and we were recording the video, and I actually didn't record on this particular bass. I recorded on the one that looked nice for the video. I can't remember what it was, but it was a, like a, I think it was like a, maybe like late 70s jazz or something. I can't remember. And then okay. randomly I'm sitting there, and there's like these three or four other jazz basses. I'm like picking them up and trying them and talking to the videographers while we're there. And I picked up one, and it was just insane. And it, you would not have bought this thing if it was, you know, on Reverb.com. It, it didn't look of anything course. special. It was insane. It was the best jazz bass I've ever played, period. And I tell, yeah. tell me why. Tell me why it was the best jazz bass you've ever played, period. It played like a dream. So it played yes. like a dream. Like, like all old jazz basses, it had, like, you know, notes that didn't work, stuff that was wrong with it, all of that stuff, yeah. right? Big chunks at yeah. the back of the neck, all of that stuff. <laughs> But it played yeah. like a dream. And when 
the the nut wasn't too thin like on some of the jazz mm-hmm. basses the you know that you get the really thin nuts the nut wasn't too thin neck felt great the setup was beautiful it responded really well do you know what i mean about yeah. responded when you of kind course. of when you dig in a little bit on the on the plucking hand the note kind of opened up how you want it to jumped got, out yeah the notes yeah. opened up and jumped out they weren't like too dead it wasn't too right. buzzy it was just sort of like they opened up perfectly it was the perfect oh. jazz bass i like i played it for oh. like literally 15 seconds i turned to mark the guy who runs the shop and i was like i have to buy this bass and he said it's already sold oh oh my god oh. Oh, come on, you're that's killing devastating. me. It was devastating. And there was these... I got goosebumps, yeah. Scott. I got goosebumps the, over my oh, arms my, right now. It's devastating. I've got, the, I've got the goosebumps on my shoulders. <laughs> there was these sexy-looking jazz basses. This was just a plain-looking... I think it was a 70s, actually. A plain-looking early 70s yep. jazz bass. Yeah. It was bonkers. It was incredible. It was one In of natural? The, was it natural, like, with a white pick guard? It was natural with a black pick guard. Black pick Natural okay. with a black pick guard. And I think it actually had the four bolt neck. Is that early, early 70s? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, that that would be, yeah, They I think they went to that. Well, they got away from four bolt in the mid to late 70s. Maybe even like 76 is when they did bullet truss rod and yeah. the micro tilt and the three bolt. Because so I have a 78 mm. that's three bolt. Yeah, so it would have been, you know, pre-76 for you. Is your is so your cool. jazz bass, is that, like, did you have a similar experience in that you picked it up and you were just like, this is incredible, or is it just like one of them yeah. basses that you learned right. to love over time? Well, I have, I'm trying to see where it is right now. So, okay, here, check this out. So for anybody wondering, this, this is, is the Desert Island bass for Ian. If 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 his house yeah, is burning down, I, this is the bass he's grabbing. <laughs> I think that's probably right. I have a, so this is my 78 Antigua. Yeah. Um, and then I also have a really beat up Sunburst 68. Mm. 68 is in a different spot. Isn't, maybe it's downstairs. Uh, that is, that's always flats. I use that for a lot of the synth stuff, but this one is rounds and it, it just, I love it. I've, I've played the hell out of it. I've done all this wear on it myself, you know. Yeah. The quick story on this is that I fell in love with this color. Dude, the Antigua is the best color they've ever done. I don't care what Man, anybody says. You know, <laughs> you know what, Scott Devine? I'm glad to hear you say that because I have a thing about Antigua yeah. that if you don't like it, I don't trust you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, if someone is like, oh, gross, I immediately question your taste about everything <laughs> but but so you know as gear addicts do we fall in love with a color and we fall in love with an idea of the instrument before the instrument arrives right i found this on ebay i bought this bass in 2004 i think mm. i found it on ebay i ended up hitting up the guy because they're so hard to find and i said i just want to buy this from you i don't want to play the auction would you sell it to me for a price and then we got to chatting and check it out he's also from montana get out he grew up in this little town yes and he went this is incredible his name's marty he went to my great grandmother's preschool (laughs) no way yeah man and he knew some people in my family and so we had this really great connection he said you're the one for this bass uh i gotta you gotta have it we agreed on a price then he said get this he goes here's the deal you just have to be the high bidder so that i can cancel so that i can end the auction so if you wouldn't mind we can even do it together get on ebay be the high bidder once you are yeah so we did i start bidding and it's going up and up and up. And now now we hit my price. Yeah. I'm still being outbid because there's someone that's put in a higher bid, oh, right? No. And he's like, oh, it's okay. He goes, it's okay. I'll still sell it to you for what I agreed on. Keep going. And I was like, Ugh. it just started to feel weird. And then I, I went and I went and I went and it got up about $600 higher than we agreed on. And then I was finally the high bidder yeah. and he canceled it. And I said, oh, Marty, I don't know. And he said, no, it's fine. I'll still sell it to you. And then he goes, oh, and, and everyone, if everyone listening, I don't recommend this, but he goes, oh, hey, here's the deal though. I don't do PayPal. Can you send me a check? Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> and because I'm an addict, he was like my dealer and he had the perfect <laughs> drug. He had the perfect drug, Scott. And so I said, 
yeah, man, what's your address? And he gave it to me and I wrote him a personal check and I put it in the mail and I crossed my freaking fingers and nice. guess what, man? Marty came through. Um, the, the thing, so it was a happy ending, no drama. He sent me the bass. We still keep in touch, man. Wow. Like I'll still nice. send him photos and videos and he's, oh man, he's, he's a great dude. Anyway, um, what I want to say about late 70s jazz basses and probably all jazz basses actually is that they are really imperfect like i got this yeah. it's so heavy it has huge neck pocket gaps mm -hmm. the pickups are kind of weak and weird but i just i just learned how to play a jazz bass and how to hear a jazz bass with this one yeah so i've tried to beat it with a bunch of other things like i have a custom i have a black custom shop here that i never play like Empirically, it's better in every way. It's lighter. The pickups are nicer. It has more low end, more output. But I always come back to this one. Yeah. So, so I'd even love to know your thoughts about that stuff too. Of like, you get used to something, and then you kind of uh, want to run with that. I've never played. Right? And yeah, then you try to beat it. I think yeah. that like it's, I've, it's a. I've never played a bass, um, an old, but I've never played a new bass and had that same. I suppose instant tonight goose pimples mm. like this is amazing. Yeah. I've never ever played a brand new bass and had that where I've played a few really a few secondhand ones and had that yeah. And interestingly, like I, I'm I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but Ken Smith wrote. He used to have a forum. In fact, I think it's still around. Um, Ken yeah. Smith had a forum and and I can't remember what the question was, but his answer was he said, look. Old instruments sound better than new ones. I'm never going to make a new Ken Smith bass that will sound like an old one. The old ones will always sound bad. And then he went into kind of like a description of why. I can't remember what that was. Sure. But Matt, if the dude who is making the bass and he's selling the bass is saying, yeah. I cannot make a bass that sounds as good as one of the old ones, there's something there. Right. Like, I'm not exactly sure yep. what it is. Magic, you know, myth. <laughs> I'm not yep. sure. But there's definitely yeah. something there. And I've never there had... There is yeah. something there. Yeah, and I, I find, I don't know about you, but I find that it's not necessarily like that the old ones are quote unquote better. They're just different. Mm -hmm. There's something that makes you kind of go, oh, and, and my 68, which I'll, I'll, I'll bust out maybe on a, another episode, but um, that one is the beat up sunburst one. That's one that I found in St. Paul, which is across the river from Minneapolis here in a shop. I wasn't I, I, at the time. I was playing Lakeland basses, yeah. and a guy said, "Oh, Ian, you gotta you gotta check that out." I looked, and it was all beat up, and I thought, "Oh, that looks cool," but nah, I, you know, I'm not into that. And I played a G. I'll never forget. I plugged it in, played a G, and it was just like, mm, like it just played the most perfect sounding G. Yeah, and it just sat and felt good and honest, and it and I and I just melted. And I yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, it's. It's real cool. But then when you A, B, compare it against new stuff, it's quieter. It's it's like, I don't know, it doesn't sound as special. Um, yeah. But like in the hands, the way it plays, the way the neck's broken in, all those things factor into this Yeah, like, man, love. I think it's the, it's love the player experience. It's the player experience. I think it's actually, it is. to hear it in the mix of a song, I'm, I'm not quite sure that, that I'd be able to do that in the stuff that I'm talking about. Like, it's definitely sort of like sure. something that, that just feels kind of different. And I think that, well... You know, Yamaha, try, I think it's to do with the resonance of the wood, and I'm not exactly sure about the science of it, but Yamaha actually tried to recreate that aging of the wood. I'm not, I can't remember how they did it, but there was some kind of, yeah. they put the wood, and it was it was like literally shaken or something for weeks. Yes, I remember they used that. They shake the bodies for weeks. Yeah. Trying to Didn't recreate. MTD maybe do that as well? I thought MTD had some kind of aging machine, or I don't, I can't remember what it was. But yes, I've heard about this as well, that the idea is that the wood... Uh, over time being vibrated, yeah. right? Sort yeah. of takes this different molecular shape. Exactly. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. I'm just putting Yamaha yeah. based yeah. aging. I wonder if it'll uh, yeah. come up on, on uh, Google. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So these manufacturers are throwing their bodies and necks in the, in the aging machine and trying to get them to open up and, you know, get that, get that vintage mojo. Yeah. Because, yeah, like Yamaha. Is this it? No, that's not it. Like, essentially, they've... 
Oh, this is it. Yamaha's acoustic resonance enhancement. Acoustic <laughs> resonance enhancement. Is this what it's Oh, maybe. I'm yeah, maybe. It's something like that. And it was Yamaha that was doing it. And, um, like, I guess, like, something's going on. You know, the, the science of it, something's going on. I, yeah. Like, it's, it definitely exists. I've never played a new instrument and, and played it, and it's had the resonance of an old instrument straight off the Yeah, bat. Like I know. I know what you it. mean. I have a I have an upright. I'm I'm dismal at it, but um, I do play it for some things. And <clears throat> I have a violinist friend who's incredible. Plays in this ensemble in New York called Ethel. They're amazing. And he talks about when you get a new acoustic instrument. Yeah. What violinists will do <clears throat> is just play like flat fives, flat five double stops, ugly double stops loud with a bow chromatically up the instrument. And he said what it does is all the like, like crazy vibration of those, of that flat five interval rubbing against itself all over mm. will start to like unlock the top of the wood. So he said the best mm. thing you can do in in uh, in classical music world, the best thing you can do to make your instrument sound better is to play things that make it resonate unevenly Got so it. that like it doesn't build up certain resonance in certain spots so that you open up that wood all over the instrument by playing flat fives all over it. I, I, I always think about that. I mean, obviously, you know, this stuff is so... <laughs> <laughs> it's so subjective. There's yeah, no yeah, yeah. real science behind, like, if you play five, fives for an hour a day, <laughs> and you're, you know, like, it will tangibly increase the, you know, there's, yeah. but, but I love the idea that, you know, <laughs> that you can make your instrument sound better by playing it, yeah. you know? And, and I think that that is the thing, right? They, they sound different and better because of how long they've been. Yeah, vibrate. There's something going on, dude. There's something going on. Something going yeah, on. Yeah, there's something yeah. going on. That day that was down in, um, it was called the shop was called Bass Direct. When I played that jazz bass, he also yeah. had five string Ken Smith in there. Mm. Oh, that was good as well. In a completely different way, but damn, of course, that was really nice yeah. as well. Really nice. Can I admit something to you? I have never. Well, for a long time, I haven't wanted a Ken Smith. I did when I was really young. Um, but then after you got the one with the frog on it, I oh, yeah. started to just, I started to just take a peek at reverb every now and again. And dude, I almost pulled the trigger on a six. I used to play. I, I, you know, if you know I this love about it. Me, I yeah. love it. Like, yes, I was dude. just going to dip my tip toe in the water and then I nearly got a six. It's like, and as then it was far like, as you can I, go. Like, like, it was like in my cart. I'm like, what am I doing? It was like $6,000. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I've got to stop. <laughs> but yeah, man, I mean, I used to, I had a Carvin six string and then a Modulus six string for years. There was a, there was a time in my like teenage years, like up through my uh, OT maybe, like, dude. early twenties. Yeah, dude. Oh yeah. I was yeah. way into ARU, like aquarium rescue unit and yeah. OTL and and I mean, I was listening to Michael Manring, and I was playing up on that high C string. There's, there's not a lot of people that know that about me, actually. <laughs> but I was way, and, and I also loved Dream Theater, so me young, and oh, like yeah, yeah. working that stuff out. But there, I I will get a six string again, <laughs> dude. Like, <laughs> it's like confessions. I, yeah, I'm I will. into it. I'm into it. I'm into yeah, it. I am too. Um, and and I'd love it to be a Ken Smith. Actually, I think I would love that. Do you you love your four string? I yeah. love it. I've, I've got it right here. I'll just, I'll just yeah. Oh, let's grab it show the people. This is show this the is, people. This is definitely the best bar. Ugh. If anybody can hear something crazy in the background, there's a guy outside my window with a strimmer, strimming the. Uh, What's a strimmer? Like a strim in the bush. Like, can you hear that? <laughs> It's like a thing. What do you it's guys call it? A strimmer it's, in the UK? Yeah, strimmer. Well, we just call it. We just call it probably the brand. We call it a weed whacker. A weed whacker. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds preposterous. That sounds, <laughs> but yes, dude, that's what we we call it. A weed whacker. So I'm just I gonna think. check this. Strimmer. I have never heard str the word strimmer in my life. Yes, yeah, strimmer. Never. Strimmer. That is. It's a grass strimmer. 
Yeah. What? It, but is it a trimmer? No, you, you're putting an S in front of the T, right? Yes. You're saying strimmer. Am I right? Yeah. I'm actually a weed, a weed whacker. What is a weed whacker? Okay, yeah. Weed same whacker, thing. dude. Yeah. Same weed, thing. Yeah, weed whacker. <laughs> Who knew? Well, next time in the States, I'll know not to go to any shop and ask for a strimmer. <laughs> <laughs> they will have no idea. Dude, I love that. Just when I think, like, I've worked for you now for a while, just when I think I have a handle <laughs> on all the differences, nope, strimmer comes out. Dude, I've never heard that. Oh, there'll be, weir- there'll be, weird, there'll be weirder ones than that, dude. There'll be weirder ones I than know, that. I know. I know there will. I know. But, dude. Th- show us that base. This, this Ken Smith, man, is definitely my best buy ever like of mm-hmm. of like secondhand bases i'm looking at i've got a really yep. cool yamaha bb but obviously you're going to be able to pick up secondhand yamaha bbs uh sure although harder to find now because you love them you big jerk yeah driving that market up i know i know that's funny <laughs> <laughs> but i've got i'm looking at that yes like, yeah this is like the, the my secondhand buy of my life you know this it was yeah. like a early 80s Ken Smith built by Vinnie Federa and it's it's yeah. hand carved and it just feels great like it's got it, like sure. it really does um it's got a like it sounds nothing like a P bass and when I think of bass I kind of hear P bass in my in my mind I'm sure yes, that you know what I'm right. talking about you know I just hear it I do and the Ken Smiths have got a real odd like it's kind of one of those love hate bass sounds and it's something to do with high mids have got sort of like yes. a, a clucky kind of sound to it and it's why when yes. you hear it in a mix it sounds or it just sounds like it does if you and a great example of this actually is teardrop by massive attack that bass oh is okay Win- winston blissett playing bass and they do like a lot li- i think it's on the live version but it might be on the recorded version and the bass just sounds like ken smith just like because, well, there was so many Smiths back in the day, wasn't they? They took over. Yes. They literally took over yes, the music they did. For, for a good few years. But um, it's definitely got that. And it's one of those tones where if I don't play it a lot, I love it. But if I play it too much, that yeah. that mid, that top of the mid there just kind of like annoys me a little bit. Kind of like fretless. Yeah. If I play too much fretless... It kind of does the same thing to me. Like I love it. Starts to like, grate on you a little a bit. A little bit. <clears throat> I'm just like, wah. You know? <laughs> oh, that's <Yeah>. so- <laughs> like, because I'm not like like, like you, you start to mock it. You're like, oh wow, wow, yeah, wow. Yeah, exactly this, right? So there's a huge difference between me and you. Obviously, you know, we're bass players, we're bold, and we're the same age, and all of that good stuff. But yes. here's the big difference, right? I am, yep. even though I've got like too many bases, I've got too many bases. Yes. I. In, I'm, I'm a one bass guy. I, ah. I am not. I can't like pick up these basses and stuff like that. I've been thinking about this ever since like a few weeks ago. You were like, "Oh, I'm just like a pick up this bass to get this sound." And I, pick, I was like, yes. "Damn, why can't I do that?" I was thinking about it. <laughs> it's because yeah. of my who, like my pathway through learning this instrument. I yes, um, I'm like a huge fan of. Like, my, my kind of bass guys, right, were Gary Willis, Elaine Caron, Scully Ferrison, yes. like all of these guys who had one instrument. So that has right. impacted my, you know, my subconscious and my psychology around basses. So I've got this weird thing that I don't even understand, but I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm a one bass guy, so I will pick up a bass and I'll just play that for a month or two months or however long it is. And then back in the yes. day, like... Man, back in the day, I had a four-string fretless. I played that thing for three or four years. I didn't have a fretted bass. I did every single gig, theater gigs. I could fretless. Oh, on a fretless. I could play that thing, and nobody (laughs) knew it was a fretless. I got so good at it. I was just sort of like... Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's all I played was fretless. I did, like, Elvis gigs on a fretless. (laughs) On a fretless. fretless. Incredible. uh, Incredible. And that's kind of sort of, like, watered down to, like, to now where I've got sort of, like, I've definitely got, I don't know, like, too many basses. But interestingly, even when I've got too many basses, I still gravitate to just one and just play that one bass. So I really want to strip back what I've got at the minute. Right. I have noticed over the years, watching your content, that you do, you have seasons with basses. Mm. Remember the Nate Mendel P bass? Oh, I mean, I remember when you were playing that thing all the time, and I was going, "Man, weird!" Like yeah. Divine's playing that that Nate the Foo Fighters bass, yeah. but it's great. And I know, dude, to, I think about this all the time because there is something about the players that you grew up loving 
playing a certain instrument where you think, ah, you want that. You want to be able to put them in a box. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think about this with Corey, like Corey Wong. He's a Strat guy. That's part of his branding. Yeah. At home, he's got other guitars. There's videos of him playing a big jazz box stuff before he was Corey Wong, right? Yeah. But imagine now if he came out and he was playing a telly. It would be weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? It becomes because part he's of a that self-proclaimed brand. Yeah. strat guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And not that not that too many people would care, but there'd be a lot of players that would notice. And and I always thought too, you know, the crazy thing is remember when Getty Lee was always either a Rickenback or a jazz bass, and he had, you know, played some weird stuff in the 80s, right? Yeah. But then always playing those iconic instruments. And then near the end of Rush's tenure, he got bass obsessed and started to buy all these things. And then he had them all out on the road on the last tour. So every tune he was switching. Yeah. He was playing a Thunderbird on a tune. <laughs> and then he was playing a Gibson EBO. Yeah. And the cr dude, the crazy thing is this. It all sounded the same. That is so no funny, matter isn't it? What Just sounded like bass him. He played. It sounded like him. It was indistinguishable. If you closed your eyes and said, what's he playing? You'd go... A jazz bass, and then you'd open your eyes, and it would be a freaking, you EBO know, some weird Gibson. Yes, yeah. and you're like, yeah. what? Yeah. And it all the way his hand hit the hit the bass. And dude, I will say too, you have a very similar thing where, like, if I close my eyes, I'd be like, that's probably a P bass. Now I can tell with the Ken Smith, but you have like a right hand attack of like when you're digging in it's and, and right getting hand. a bass yeah, to open yeah, up and speak. Yeah, yeah. You have a sound. Right? And that sound goes across everything that you play. It's so and weird, so, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yes, I suppose it's yes, but, not but it's weird, also but it's just bonkers. It's so cool though. It's so cool. It is very cool. Like, um, I I noticed that about the great like players and musicians that I play with all sound the same no matter what they play. Yeah. If if you're really good, I feel like you kind of your brain then is gonna tell your hands how to get your sound. Yeah. Or even when you plug into an amp, you're going to turn those knobs until your brain is satisfied, right? Yeah. I have a guitar player friend who who played in Soul Asylum and plays in all these all these great bands and he'll do this complete rig overhaul where he'll change amps, pedals, uh, you know, cables, the guitar, pickups, everything is different yeah. and he plugs in and plays and it sounds identical <laughs> <laughs> so i have the same thing about you in that antigua jazz bass every time you could play any bass and in my mind if i close my eyes i'd be like that's the jazz bass interesting yeah it's, yeah it's so weird. And i had a great um experience actually like the the guy that kind of got me to play um or, or interested in picking up the bass was a guy called schoolie sreverson an icelandic guy yeah. who played with alan holsworth and he did a, a bass a solo piece. on low levels high stakes um I can't remember what the album was, but that was the track, Low Levels, High Stakes. Anybody listening should yeah. go listen to that right now. Just drop everything, go listen to it. It's amazing. Yeah. But that bass that he used on that, it was just phenomenal. It was a Kerbo six-string. Kerbo, remember? Oh, Greg, sure. Yeah, Kerbo six-string. Of course. And anyway, so like years later, I ended up at Schoolie's place. So I'm at Schoolie's place. The bass is there. I'm like, oh. <gasps> I picked it oh. up. It sounded nothing like him it just sounded of course. like me i was i was like yeah. no and it was that it was a huge moment for, I, I was like yes. oh i get it now you know it's actually nothing to do with this bass it's just to nothing. do with how he plays and, yeah uh, and how he has how his brain and hands have adapted to this instrument right um dude i had a very similar thing i got to interview i worked at my college radio station in the late 90s yeah. and i got to interview victor wooten who came to play at a club in Minneapolis. Yeah. And he had his Fodera behind him. The whole time we were doing the interval, I'm just sneaking glances, man, <laughs> at, his, at his cool 80s Fodera, the one with the Kale, you know, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. with the tram yeah, and yeah. from the Super Technique Space video, whatever. And at the end, I just said, Victor, I'm a bass player. And, and he immediately knew. He was like, oh, do you want to check out the Fodera? And I was like, yes, is that? And he was like, oh, no problem, nice. yeah. And he was so not precious with it. It was just, it was actually... That alone was really inspiring to me. I, I was always like, uh, you know, to other people, like, keep your greasy mitts off my base, yeah, man. Yeah, you know, yeah, but he yeah. was like, no, man, they're Just meant to be. And I was, a, I was ready to have this transcendent experience with Victor Wooten's base. 
dude. And it, and it was like it was good, but it was just okay. Yeah, just a base. Like it was just a base. Yeah, it's, it's... <laughs> it was a Fodera, but it wasn't set up. It was like higher than I anticipated. Like the setup was like a little bit like beefier than I was. I was like, oh, and like the string balance was totally different than I thought it would be. And I, it was like so awkward. Weird, and I thought, yeah. oh, I don't, I wouldn't buy this in a shop. Yeah. You Do you know, know Hadrian Ferro? Victor Wooten's bass. Do you know, Hadrian, yeah, Hadrian Ferro, right? He's probably like the fastest bass player on the planet. Yeah. I don't want to say just the fastest. He's probably, in terms of improvisation, he's like probably, you know, one of the most, if not the most advanced bass player on the planet, right? Well, <laughs> I've played his bass um, a few different times. The action is not low. It's not really. Ah, uh, it's not low. It's not <laughs> low. It's bonkers. Like you just expect it to be just like like almost glued. Just lay. Yeah, just laying on top of the fingerboard. Yeah. It is not low. It was higher wow. than mine. I don't have a high action. I mean, a low action. His action was higher than mine. I was like, wow. Oh. He's just phys- physically a mutant. You know, it's just like right in, in the best way possible. <sighs> Do you know what yeah. you were talking about with Corey Wong, though, in the Strat? What I wanted yep. to do, yep. and I, I mentioned it earlier, my my history with P-Bases. This is, yes, please. It's just, it's just like, it's something, um, it's just worth mentioning. And it's interesting for up-and-coming players as well, I think. Like, I'm not sure what's interesting about it, but I think just just putting it out there into the into the world will be, you know, get people, like, some people thinking about it. When I was yes. starting SBL, so... Just before I started SBL, I had, I'm trying to remember the bass. I had like a five string active bass. I think I had a, oh, I had an E, like a signature overwater thing with a high C. I remember that bass. So it was like E to C and and that whole thing. In fact, remembering now, I actually recorded my first few videos on that bass. Yeah, I know. I've watched them. Yes. I love it. Oh, okay. So I got going with SBL, and the first few videos, I'm either playing a kind of E to C style instrument, solo style instrument, or I'm playing, I think, like a jazz bass or something like that. Mm. At the same time, there was like a few different dudes trying to do online bass lessons, and they were sort of, of course. Like, and it, there was a whole E to C thing going on. Everybody, you know, it was like Tony Gray, <laughs> Yannick Guizdala, uh, yeah. Chris Tarry, who was like B to G. But still, it was very, it was that thing, right? Yeah. And I just sat there one day and I thought, I'm just in the same mix. I'm just the same. Oh, and, 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 so and all of these guys are amazing. I was like, mm. I, so I can either try and just be a crappy version of them Oh, I'm going to have to mm. come at this from a different angle. And the day after, oh. I bought a P bass. And here's, you are here's the me. truth. I used to hate the tone of a P bass. The, yeah. the reason I actually started playing P bass, it, there's two things happen. First, I had that thought. I was like, I just need to like differentiate myself so much that there's no comparison. Ever. Yes. I mean, they, they're not comparing us because I'm not, yes. I, I, they're just amazing. These guys are just like phenomenal. They can just like right. improvise for 10 hours without even right. one bead of sweat. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I like, I can't or, compete yes, with that. Yes, right. So, so how right. do I, how do I just not compete with that? And that's, and that's when I got the P bass. So there was that, that sort of like idea. And then also the Pino thing. I like heard Pino play and I was like, well, maybe P basses are cool. I was like, P bass is completely different to what, what anybody else is playing. I'm going to get a P bass. I bought the P bass, and then a guy that was working with me at the time, it was so he was like, "He bought a P bass," because it was <laughs> the P bass thing wasn't really big at the time. P you know, right, just that, you know was doing that thing, but nobody else was re- really playing P basses, and and I that's why I started playing P basses was nothing to do with I loved P basses. It was like I just need to be different to everybody else. And that's Dude, I am so. The, I, I I have I have goosebumps. <laughs> like, I, that is super inspirational to me. I have to tell you too because I was checking out YouTube and all those guys. Right? I mean, I've been following Yannick forever. I've been following you forever. And when you started to play P bass, I mean, I don't necessarily remember like the day where the shift happened or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But what I can tell you is that I immediately noticed. Oh, here is a guy that is from that kind of like fusion jazz school, but is not playing the like 
the typical just based. Uh, yeah. yes yeah. and it was really and and it was it made me curious and it made me interested and it made me think that you were cooler do you know exactly what i'm saying that, yeah like it made yeah. me think i was like oh he's getting it done on like you know, he's working harder. It's not this fancy thing with all the electronics that, you know, and with the super low action. Like, he's playing flats on a P and talking about melodic minor. This is insane. Exactly. And it was super hip. Well, that's, what, and that's I why love... I did it. It was all engineered. Dude. It was all engineered. <laughs> so here's the weird thing. That's incredible. It was all engineered. The only reason... I used yep. to love them high, them high Cs. The only reason yeah. that I got the P bass was to really differentiate what I was doing so people didn't put me in with that same bulk of of all the other guys that were trying to yep. do it because they were just so good and I couldn't compete. I don't want to compete. <laughs> I just want to right. do my yeah. own thing. So I got the P bass and... And it was a, it was just on a whim at the time. I, like I didn't really know what what was going to happen. And just to point out as well, and nobody nobody was doing it at the time. Like now, there's a lot yeah. of really fantastic uber bass players that play yes. p basses. Like the first guy that jumps to mind is probably Nick Campbell. Do you know what I mean, like of course he's bonkers. Yeah. You know what I mean, like the, and there's a, yep. a lot of guys that are doing it. But yeah, so it was all born out of a, uh, trying to differentiate myself. And I think that oh. you know, like I differentiated myself for for reasons to do with like online education and, and kind of, yep. you know, separate myself from the herd as it were. But there's also, you know, for all musicians, we can think about how other people perceive us and like what gigs we might get from that. And and I know it's a strange thing to say. It's really true. Yeah. I've had great conversations with, um, I, okay, I'm not going to mention his name, but I had a great conversation with this this guy who everybody who listens to this podcast is going to know, right? He's phenomenal. Yes. He's like in yes. in the percent of a percent of a percent, right? Um, yes. Same as Hadrian, total mutant. And the, Oh, I just want to know and, who and, it is. And, so and, <laughs> and the guy was really struggling to get gigs, and he was like, mm. I've been pigeonholed. He said, I play this type of bass, I play this type of music, I just don't get yes. calls for any of these other gigs. And he was yes, and he was really frustrated by that, and and, and rightly so as well, because he can absolutely do the gigs, he can do the, you know, he could do the sessions, and he can do the the the, the soundtracks, you know, the, the film dates and stuff like that. He could do all that. He lives out in L.A. He doesn't get the the, the calls because people because of him. the association with maybe I, I have guesses who it is i won't say though with, but the association with the instrument the association with the style of music that he plays yeah. that he's maybe more of a soloist yeah. right that he's not getting the calls to do the meat and potatoes exactly things. that yeah exactly that i have a question for you when you decided to take that turn aesthetically so this was really a thing about aesthetics mm -hmm. you said i want to differentiate myself from the pack I'm going to play a P bass. Yeah. And I then was it a conscious decision like you forced yourself to fall in love with that sound because dude, I also hated the P bass growing up. Oh, that's interesting. Hated yeah. it. Yeah. And then, Worst tone then I, ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's the, really the way I felt because I came up listening to different kinds of music. Yeah. And now of course I have an appreciation for it. I play it a bunch on all kinds of different things, but I had to learn how to love it. But it seems to me like when you play a P bass, you did really embrace it. It transferred from being an aesthetic choice to really being one of an authentic tone thing for you too. It's totally you changed love my a plane. P bass. It's totally changed my point. Yeah, I was gonna like, or else you're the best actor in the world because when you pick up a P and play it, I'm like, oh, that sounds like Scott. And so, so you made this choice aesthetically, but then you ended up falling in love with that sound. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah, fell in love with the sound. Fell in love with the. I can't remember what the. I think I that got that custom shop to begin with. Maybe I'm not sure. But um, the white one, yeah, the, white, the white, the red, white, and blue I one. I think so. Yeah. yeah, that's got an action like a dog on it. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> side note. But um, yeah, I just um, it was definitely. I can remember getting it. I got the bass, and I just went full Pino. I can remember just learning all of Pino's lines, all of the John yeah. Mayer stuff, which was really fantastic. Yeah. And the reason why is because for me that was a critical part of learning how to play that instrument. Because I'm like yes. a jazz bass is a different instrument to a P bass. A P bass is a different instrument to a Ken Smith. A Ken Smith is different instrument. They're all kind of different, like because they're different sonically, you kind of end up playing yes. them differently. So I really had to learn how to play the P bass. I didn't know how to play the P bass. So I learned a lot of, of John Mayer lines and I went 
really heavy into James Jameson as well because yeah, he's obviously of course. you know learning how to play that stuff was uh, was kind of sort of like a key a key thing and then obviously I played anyway so all of my kind of stuff got mixed in there and then that ended up who I am now as a player but it, it definitely um, completely changed the way that I approach playing and also like what I love in an instrument so for me I really like like P bases like this Alinto down here has got a forty four yeah. mil neck like a nut. It's forty four mil, like a wide, a wide one. Yes, yes, yes. That's my favorite neck width on a P base. It's so ultimately, yes. I'm saying I like it to be harder to play. Does that mean like, does it right. make any sense? But I just like <laughs> no. It. But I know what you mean. It just it it brings out kind of like there's a a touch of a struggle. Mm. It seems kind of legit. It maybe harkens to upright a tiny bit. Like there's a little just bit of like oh you got to be a little more tenacious, yeah. right? Versus the tiny neck where everything's kind of presented to you, and then it's it's a smaller, more predictable sound versus a P bass where you pull it and the action's maybe a little high, and it's like rah that split coils barking back at you. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, man, I totally get it. Have you seen? I mean, it's funny, dude. You talk about P basses, so so I this is a sixty five, oh. and and I bought this from Norman's Rare Guitars nice. before the prices just went Bonk. bananas. Yeah. But it's that cool, like the cool logo, and I mean, it's a huge neck and and pretty thin too. But you know, just that like big '60s, yeah. uh, mid '60s neck, L plate. So you know, they, they although it was CBS era, it was built with all the stuff yeah. from uh, from pre CBS era. But check it out, man. I was I was you know active bass guy, and then I got a jazz bass, and that was my act into Fender. I got that Antigua bass. Now I'm a Fender guy. Okay, cool. But then Pino, right? Mm. You. Hurley. Hurley. Lefay. Oh, yeah. Right? Like the, all of these people that I admired and looked up to started to play P basses and started to say things like, oh, this is the real thing. I, I mean, I remember seeing a Sean Hurley interview where he said something like, this is a real man bass. And I thought it was sort of, I, I remember thinking it was kind of preposterous, but also like it kind of like got in and was like poking at some things inside of me, like, oh, gee, am I, you know? So. So I ended up going hard down the P bass thing, and then when I when I joined Eric Hutchinson's band, this is what I brought, and I only played P for a while, and I was really, I was so invested in being one of the guys. Mm. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was invested in, and then there was a point at which I made the shift like you decided to like okay there's a lot of these people playing p basses and i have a really light touch and i don't bark like you mm -hmm. do on a p bass i have a very like soft approach yeah. and i decide Set there was almost a day sensual. where i decide almost sensually in. <laughs> <laughs> but not quite <laughs> Anyway, what, so what did you decide there, on this day? Th there was a day where I said, I got to be me at the expense of what my snarky friend is going to think who loves the P bass. Mm -hmm. I got a couple of friends who were like, oh man, it's so much better when you play a P. But then most people didn't care. And I really just decided when I am going to be doing something that is feels like me, I want it to be on a jazz yeah. because I'm not trying to be Sean Hurley. Exactly. I'm not trying to be you. I'm not trying to be Lefebvre. I, I want to be me. Yeah. And still have, of course, a super healthy respect for everyone doing their thing and still play a P bass when it, when it should be a P bass. Yeah. Like in, in session world, you know, I'm, I will not take the jazz bass because it's my sound. Like I just did a record a couple weeks ago where it's like I played this bass the most and it's amazing. But whenever I play it, it feels like somebody else's bass. Oh, that's so you interesting. Know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. And I have never, like, I tried so hard to make the switch. I love it, yeah. And whenever I put a jazz bass in my hands, it feels like home. That's exactly, you that's know? what people should look for, isn't it? That's really, and unfortunately, yes. you need to sort of, like, try a lot of basses to find that. But that's the, the ultimate kind of... Uh, green light, isn't it? Of, of finding where your sound is. It's finding wh what feels like home, no matter what yeah. the actual bass is, no matter <clears throat> if it's a jazz bass or P bass or whatever. Yeah. 
And I, I love, dude, I love this idea that you saw all the people playing the Foderas and the, and you decided to do something that leaned in a different direction. And obviously tons of people play P bases, but for the stuff you were doing at the time, it was a left turn. Yeah. And it, that's so cool. And for me to, in a, a lesser extent, and I mean, you know, we're talking about Fender basses that everybody plays, but for me too, I saw everyone just like, oh, P bass. There was this P bass club of cool guys. Yeah. And I was like, I can't compete with that. Exactly. So I'm going to go back to the thing that feels really like great to me. And then what happens, what happened for you and what has happened for me too, is people see that commitment to something that may be a little left of center. Mm -hmm. And then they start, then they want to, then they're like, oh, you know, why do you play that? Or like, and then they're influenced by that, by that yeah, commitment. Yeah. And so for anybody listening, like if you love your, you know, your Schecter, you know, you love your, you know, whatever it is, yeah. right, that you play that maybe, maybe isn't always the coolest thing. If, if you love it, do it. Yeah, absolutely. Because that, like, your commitment to that thing. Like, dude, I never wanted an Ibanez bass more than after I saw Gary Willis. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's fascinating, isn't it? Playing and those sound gears. Yeah. I was like, oh. The depth yes. of it. And I never cared about Ibanez before that, really. I mean, I have an Ibanez fretless. It's an, one from the 80s. But that, that's for sure. It's partly Sting. But it's for sure Gary, too. Yeah, yeah. You know? How long have we got you for, dude? Another, like, two, have you got, like, seven minutes? You have to go at quarter past, right? Yeah, I got seven dude, minutes. Dude. Yeah, for in sure. In the middle of the night, you know, when you're lurking Please. on your phone, or when you're on the toilet, yes. wherever, you know, what are you looking at currently? Yes. What, what, yes. what are you geeking out on currently? Okay, so I... I have a thing now because of like playing on records. Um, I have this thing of I want to experience in my life one good example of all of the classics. Oh, like, you know, when I did the 10 bases you have to play before you die video for SBL, like those are all my instruments. Yeah. So I have this thing where when I went hard down the vintage road, I was like, okay, I'm going to get a good 50s style P bass with a single coil. I'm going to get a great, P bass, just so so my thing, and like a great Gibbs, like a Thunderbird. Mm. Even though I'm not playing that thing a lot, <laughs> but I want like I, I like there's a list, like, tick 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 off the list. Recently, I have bought some of the most ridiculous things. <laughs> um, can can I show? You? Yeah, <laughs> can um, I show you yeah. one thing? Uh, all right, so. So, so it went from being, you know, 60s and 70s and vintage stuff to then I cross this line, this threshold has been crossed into the 80s and 90s, and it is the wild freaking yeah. West, dude. Like, like I... Are we talking Steinbergers or... <laughs> well, well, it's on the list, but check this out. Do you know this, babe? Is that Hamer? Ready for this? Oh, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I was a huge King's X fan, oh, yeah. Doug Pinnock, yeah. a huge Cheap Trick fan, Tom Peterson. So, yeah, man, I have a Hamer 12. Amazing. It's preposterous. <laughs> um, so, so the thing with me with basses is, is I like them to be thumbprint. I like them to have a thing. Mm. And then I like to try to adapt. Like when I'm playing a different bass that isn't my Antigua jazz bass or my beat-up Sunburst jazz yeah. bass, I'm then giving... I'm, I want the bass to lead the way in a sense where like I'm changing myself because you can't play this like you would play a jazz bass. So then that's how I'm trying to get inspired to make new sounds is let the instrument inform me how it wants to be played. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, the long, the long answer to your question is right now I'm in eighties zone. I, I have a, I have a NS2, um, uh, Spectre NS2 yeah. that I love. I have a Kubicki Factor oh, yes. that I really love. Do you you want to see Stu Ham, Here, dude? Come on! Oh, I know. I can remember watching I them Stu Ham videos yeah. back on. I can remember when Hot Licks, Alan Roth used to run a Hot Licks, the VHSs. Of course. Oh, man. Yes. Check it. Stu is I have amazing. a Black Factor. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. With the headstock, with the. Uh, with the detuner, you know, I'm actually you quite drop. surprised. Maybe it's going to happen. Yeah, it's got that detuner thing, hasn't it? Like, I'm quite surprised yeah. that the '80s thing hasn't gone full bore in 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 well, bass because, 
and like maybe because obviously eight is like aesthetics on from the musical perspective, fashion perspective, it, that's full on yeah. going on. It has been for many years now. Full on. But it hasn't really yeah. got into musical instruments, and I'm kind of waiting for it. You know, I'm waiting for the headlesses to come back. I'm waiting for the well. You know, that I mean, thing. I man, I, in in metal, they for sure are really in metal. There was there was a band that I loved. Yeah, there's a Canadian band called Protest the Hero that I loved in the 2000s, and those dudes were playing Steinbergers and stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think I th- you'd be surprised, man. I wanted to get an XL2 Steinberger, like a white mm-hmm. Steinberger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what i want yeah and they're four or five grand they're crazy money yeah i mean which is and that's not 15 grand like an old fender but there was a time where you could pick up a steinberger oh, for 800 so bucks cheap. yeah so cheap. that time is long gone yeah. and kubikis are crazy money now too yeah um these are these are up in the three and four thousand dollar neck of the woods now so so it's it's coming so yeah man a uh, but but sorry i just uh so tangenty i i I want to get a bass hero bass from the 90s. I would love a six string Ken Smith. Mm, yeah, me <laughs> Even too, though, dude. Like playing it would be playing it would be silly. Like people would be like, what is he doing? <laughs> uh, but but there's just something about that that harkens. So so for me right now, what it is, is it's childhood. Um when I'm looking for stuff, I'm looking to fill that nostalgia thing. Yeah. Before that, I was looking, I was getting a Hoffner. I was getting my session bass ducks in a row, getting the Hoffner, right? Getting a really cool late 70s Stingray. Yeah. Like, just so that when clients or artists say, oh, we want that like Rickenbacker, like a bang, I've got a great Rickenbacker that I use. Um, but yeah, man, now it's nostalgia. Now I want the Steinberger. I want the Ken Smith. I want those basses that I, I went through a period of, um, pretending that I hated them, or or like, oh yeah, that pff, I, that's not cool. Like I'm done with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, done with yeah. that. I'm re- I'm ready for them back in my life. What about you, man? What's on What's on your list? Oh man, too many. I was just thinking then we should have a part two of this because I've definitely not. I'm not all out. I need to. I, I've got like a good hour left in me to talk about bass gear, specifically basses. Actually, let's, should we do a part two? Let's. I, I, we we absolutely could do a part yeah. two. We could do this forever. I want to talk about like Seric. <laughs> Seric. I want to talk. I want. I've got questions about Seric. I've got questions about what's the company that's just building you a base at the minute. Voren Saku. Voren Saku. I've got questions about this. Mm-hmm. I've got like a bunch of questions. And Lorita too. Oh, Lorita, you are yeah, just, man. such a slut. Look at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they slut you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, dude, I will say part of it for me, though, is that I, I, I really connect with people. Yeah. And if I have a great experience, man, I had a phone call with, uh, with Saku Viore from mm. Born Saku, and he is such a great dude. And we just chatted it up, man. Yeah. We just chopped it up. Yeah. As Doug Wimbish would say, we chopped it up. And we had such a good hang. And I just said to him, you know, he said, what do you want? And I said, I want you to... I want you to make me the most Finnish bass possible He's from Finland, <laughs> right? I said like, and I would love to choose some things, but I wanted to have your your DNA, your personality, because with something that isn't my Antigua jazz bass, like I say, I'm bending myself to try to get the the best thing out of the instrument. Mm. I mean, you know, what would be so, great? So what would be great is that actually like going through that whole process that you went through when when you ordered that bass. Like, what should people be thinking about when they're thinking about ordering a bass? And like, yeah, absolutely. Oh, maybe we should. Do- oh. <laughs> okay, so like next episode, ordering a custom bass. Let's yeah. talk about that. Oh, dude. Uh, and 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 I'm sure you have this too, but I've ordered some stuff over the years. I mean, I ordered my first custom base from Carvin. Mm. Then I ordered a custom base from Zahn, from yeah. Joe Zahn. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have I have tales. I'm sure you do too. I would, dude. I would love to. Oh, do that. Let's, let's do, do it. it. I'm going in. Right, dude. I'll see you next week, <laughs> dudes, listeners. Love. Thank it. you for listening. Where should we send them? We're on all of the places, Spotify's and the iTunes. Yeah, we're, and we're everywhere. We're everywhere. We're like a disease, a base disease. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a disease that you want to have. Yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely. Come on. Yeah. This, is a, <laughs> this is an affliction that you need in your life. This is not. <laughs> absolutely. Well, thanks for listening, guys, and we will catch you next time. Take it easy. Bye-bye.